All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We're here to celebrate a historic, sustainable, balanced, fiscally responsible, and overwhelmingly bipartisan biennial budget. Our budget delivers on key investments in child care and K through 12 education, special education, gun violence prevention, hospitals and federally qualified health centers, housing, transportation, and workforce transportation. Um, we are so pleased to be here with all of our partners who help make this possible. This is also a budget that will provide real relief to our taxpayers. It's the largest personal income tax cut in our state's history. Uh, we're so proud to help save our middle and working class households an extra $300 to $500 a year in the 2024 tax year. And overall, through the tax cuts in this budget, we expect to save taxpayers more than $460 million a year. And we're able to cut taxes at the same time, honoring our fiscal guardrails and paying down our state's debts. And we have a committed responsibility to making sure that we will be keepers of uh, sound fiscal budgets for our state and for a brighter fiscal future. And all of these folks who are standing here from our legislative branch, along with um, our tireless OPM secretary, Jeff Beckham, our committee chairs and our leaders and our staff were the ones that helped put this uh, historic budget together and uh, to get us to this great place. So congratulations to all of our uh, leaders. Thank you to our staff for helping to make this possible. With that, I will hand it off to our House Speaker, Matt Ritter. Thanks, Governor. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> sure, take it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I want to, first of all, uh, uh, echo what the Lieutenant Governor said, but also I want to note that our Chairwoman of our Appropriations Committee, Tony Walker, and our Chairwoman of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee, Maria Horn, are on vacation, and I would have it no other way. I think Jason and I said, we'll handle the press conference. You did a lot of the hard work. Um, but I also want to add something that I've been saying to people in interviews since we did the budget. It, sometimes in politics, we get pigeonholed into what we did this one year or these last two years. And it makes sense, right? It's a biennium budget. But this budget is a continuation of a lot of successes that what you saw in 2020 and 2019. And so if you're not going to have budgets in 2021 that continue good work, what you did in the short term shouldn't really matter all that much. So let's go back to a couple years ago when we got the earned income tax credit to its highest level. It's even higher now. When we said to people in Hartford and New Britain whose car tax rates were double what they are in suburban towns, we're going to make a statewide mill rate of 32, and we're continuing that policy. So when you add up three years and four years of stability and successes without rolling back the investments that we made, that's how you get a really good product. That's what I'm most proud of. I think that's what the House Democrats is most proud of is we made promises, we ran on those promises, and we kept those promises, while all the while working with our friends across the aisle to do more historic tax cuts, investments in education, and as, as the governor mentioned, investments in um, the higher education system above what appropriations wanted us to do. We're really proud of those things. So we got a lot of speakers. It's an honor to serve with all these people up here. We had a wonderful session, and I look forward to getting back next year after some rest. Thanks. My pleasure to introduce our Senate President, Marty Looney. Thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor. There is a great deal, I think, to celebrate in this budget. As the, as the Speaker said, uh, we do make, I think, a, a, a significant additional investment in K-12 education. There is a, we recognize the need, the post-pandemic need there uh, is even greater than it was. Those problems have been pointed out to us with kids returning to school, having their education disrupted and all of that, and we meet uh, that with a significant infusion of, of new money, both for ECS and other general education purposes. We are also uh, addressing the issue of the uh, excess cost for special ed, putting $25 million extra a year uh, into the budget for those purposes because, as we all know, uh, municipalities cannot plan 
for when a very expensive special ed case might become uh, their responsibility. So we are addressing that in the budget as well. Uh, we uh, uh, put additional money into, uh, into higher ed above what had been uh, originally proposed. Uh, we also increased the, the, the level of funding for uh, pilot funding, both for college and hospital and for state property pilot to those municipalities who have a significant amount of, uh, of tax exempt uh, property. So uh, there is a lot in this budget and the tax cut uh, I think is historic primarily for, primarily for the reason that it does make our income tax more progressive. Ever since the income tax was adopted in 1991, we have been struggling to build progressivity into it because at that time, uh, the, only, the only income tax we could get the votes for uh, was the flat rate 4.5%. percent only rate, uh, this, this, I was in the House at the time, we had the votes then for a more progressive income tax, but the Senate did not, so we had to settle for the one that Nicker, Senator Nickerson was willing to vote for. But uh, ever since then, uh, we have been building more progressivity uh, into our income tax by creating the, uh, the tiered structure of rates so that most people pay a blended rate in their income tax, and now this break is concentrated on the lower income people, those who are taxed at uh, 3%, that the tier at 3% is down to 2, the tier at 5% is down to 4.5, that's significant progressive tax relief moving in the right direction. So uh, again, I think there's a great deal to celebrate here. Our appropriations uh, chair, uh, Kathy Austin is here, who just did such important work throughout the entire entire session, and I want to thank uh, her in particular, our Majority Leader Bob Duff, uh, who was a, a, a strategist, a partner, a, a worker, a consensus builder uh, on all of this. I think our Finance Chair, John Fanfara, is not here right now because he's out campaigning in hopes of not being here next January, uh, when, <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> helping to be in another office rather than, uh, rather than here. But in any case, he did a great job as well. Uh, the Finance Committee, there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, of good stuff in that package, and. Uh, uh, and responsiveness to the needs of, uh, of the state. So again, uh, thanks to all, and again, uh, it's always a pleasure working with, uh, with the governor, and uh, uh, he is always uh, uh, willing to give a hearing to things, uh, even, if, uh, even if he doesn't always come to final agreement, but he's always, uh, always willing to engage, and I want to thank him on that. Again, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Looney. My pleasure to introduce Senate Majority Leader Bob Duff. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Well, this budget is focused like a laser beam on the middle class in the state of Connecticut, and I'm so proud of what we've accomplished in this budget. We have more, more funding for secondary education, uh, more funding for higher education, and more funding for our municipal governments. That clearly and squarely helps the middle class here in the state of Connecticut, and that's really what this budget is about. Uh, having record uh, type of tax cuts and record type of investments as well. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank, uh, as Senator Looney did, our, our chairs of appropriations and finance, uh, and certainly thank all the folks who are here with me today, and of course our Senate President who uh, helps lead the conversation, leads the conversation, and, and asks the tough questions and makes sure that uh, we are pushing as hard as we can for our caucus and their priorities as well. So thank you, Senator Looney, for what you do, and of course our Speaker, our House Majority Leader, House Minority Leader, and our Senate uh, Republican leader as well. Everybody really played a hand in this uh, today, and of course, want a, a special shout out to our Lieutenant Governor and Governor Lamont for, for again, as Senator Looney said, always giving things a fair hearing. He may not always agree with some ideas that are out there, but he, he is a collaborator and he does work together with folks, and that is very much appreciated when you're trying to put together a budget that will get a majority of votes uh, here in the legislature. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, look forward to seeing you sign the budget. Thank you. Thank you. And i just like to acknowledge and thank the House Majority Leader, Jason Rojas, who in the interest of brevity has opted not to speak. I was going to say the same thing everyone else does. <laughs> <laughs> We're just out of line, Jay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Jason. And now uh, it's my pleasure to bring up House Minority Leader, Vin Candelora. Thank you. I want to um, certainly thank the governor and, and thank our leaders in the, in the House and the Senate. You know, the difference for re the Republican votes on this budget this year than two years ago, I think we had voted for, is that this document does reflect collaboration and input from the Republican Party. And I want to thank the governor for bringing us into the room and listening to what we had to say. It, it certainly is a continuation of the spirit of those fiscal restraints that we put in place um, to be able to now extend tax relief to our residents. That was part of the reason why um, we put those there. Um, additionally, we are right-sizing government a bit. You know, in order to pay for the education 
uh, reforms that were put in place and pay for higher ed dollars, um, governments sacrificed. I mean, we saw the agencies uh, right-sizing their workforce, and with those savings, we're able to give back more to the state of Connecticut. So um, I just want to thank the governor um, for his work and cooperation on this, and certainly thank the Democrats in, in the House and Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Also want to acknowledge State Representative Anthony Nolan. Anthony, thank you so much for your leadership. And I'd like to invite up the Senate Appropriations Chair, Kathy Austin. So uh, I'm certain you're going to have Holly come up, but I wouldn't mind having Anthony join me and Holly join me because as the worker bees behind the, in the, the, behind the leaders, um, I just want to thank everybody for allowing us to do the job that we have been able uh, to accomplish um, this year. I'd like to take off from what uh, the speaker said. Uh, this is a budget that builds on top of other years. Going all the way back to 2017 when we sat down in a room to struggle um, with not enough money to go around for basic programs and this budget covers a lot of those basic programs and it does it because we've all sat down and had those very, very hard conversations and I want to thank my colleagues uh, that um, stand behind uh, Representative Walker and I and stand in front of us and everybody working and talking and uh, going in one uh, way so that we can work for the people of the state of Connecticut. I want to thank the governor for all he does and the lieutenant governor for coming to all of our communities. So we really appreciate it. So thank you. And I don't know if either one of you are Let's speaking. Let's start with um, Holly Cheeseman, who is the House Finance Ranking Member. And then we'll go to Anthony. Thank you. I want to thank everyone gathered here today because as everyone has said, without the kind of collaboration and willingness to listen to different ideas. And I think that was a big change this time, that we as Republicans, whether in the House and the Senate, actually had a seat at the table. Would we have liked to see a bit more aggressive in terms of tax relief? Absolutely. I don't think we can do enough to recognize what our residents face every day. I would have loved to have seen something my side, child income tax deduction, child tax credit on the other side. Connecticut is one of the few states in the country that doesn't recognize family size in the tax code. But this is a good product, as everyone says, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And this is a document we can all be proud of, on which we can work going forward, and puts us and the residents of Connecticut, whom we serve, in a very good place going forward. So thank you all. I, I just want to say it's, it's, it's an honor to, to stand with the leadership um, and the guidance that they were able to give. Kathy and Tony did a Herculean, Herculean thing uh, with this budget. Um, and as was talked about, ECS funding, one of the priorities um, that we had, uh, K through 12, um, higher ed, uh, the pilot, um, those things are, are some of the great things uh, that we were able to accomplish this year. Um, and it was just because of teamwork. And I'm just proud to stand up here uh, with everyone. Thank you to the governor and the Atlantic governor, um, the Senate uh, leadership. Um, uh, and uh, definitely I want to give a big shout out to uh, Jason Rojas. Um, uh, because without his education, uh, that we receive uh, sometimes in some of the meetings away from uh, people. Uh, we wouldn't be able to be as successful as we are, so I just want to say thank you. And we're going to invite up our OPM secretary, Jeff Beckham. Well, uh, I was very lucky to be asked uh, by the governor to serve in this role this year. Uh, this was one of the best years for a budget that I can remember. We had plenty of money to go around. We were able to cut some taxes as well as make these historic investments that everyone has talked about. Uh, and we'll still be making a waterfall deposit this year of $2 billion. So state's in very good hands, and it's due to the hard work of all the people you see up here. Thank you. And our fearless leader of Connecticut, Governor Lamont. All right, so... Um, I love this era of good feeling. Uh, may it last. 
I love the fact that uh, each and every one of you work together so well. Um, you and Ben, Ben and Matt, that was good. You disagree, but you disagree, and compromise is not a dirty word. And Marty and uh, your Limber Quinn, um, twin, uh, Kevin Kelly, who's not here today because he's um, celebrating our, our Quinnipiac uh, Bobcats down in uh, Washington, D.C. We are the state of champions, you know, yes, the state of champions. Uh, and we're also the state of opportunity. And for me, was listening to your comments, um, this is a budget about opportunity. Um, five months ago or whatever, you know, I said, we're moving from lifelines to ladders. And these are ladders of opportunity. And I like to think that's the heart and soul of what this budget's about. Started with um, basic expansion of daycare and childcare, give those kids the very best head start in life, and allow mom and dad to get back to work. You know, moving from there, biggest, you know, an expansion in terms of debt-free community college and making sure that that's more widely available so you can get the skills you need. And a free workforce training with a guaranteed job on the backside of that and providing the daycare and the transportation, the rent relief you need to make sure that uh, you can take full advantage of this, be, get your hand on that rung of that ladder, that ladder of opportunity. You know, other things I, I Appreciate. Once you get that job, maybe you think about starting your own business, the resources we have to help you start that own business. Baby bonds is a part of what that is all about. Time to own so that more people can afford that first down payment on their first home so they um, can have a piece of the action right here in the great state of Connecticut. So in a personal note, I just want to thank each and every one of you. You know, finance and the probes, you had really some tough lifting to do, and uh, you did it together. And um, what this says about the state, look around the rest of the country. I like the way Connecticut led today. Let's sign the damn budget. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Do my baseball no, line. Matt, I'm, 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 I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so so we'll do um, on topic budget related questions with all of these experts. Speaker, you correct me if I misrepresent what you said last week. The speaker was talking about carry forwards as something that will be inevitable given the revenue cap that you built in will be a point and a half basically surplus every year so that's now part of the budget process do you view that as a gimmick or do you view that as necessary flexibility under the three caps that you defend well let's see what we can afford next year that's why we gave ourselves some flexibility but if we do have a surplus in the coming years that does give us a little more flexibility but in some of these programs you know we did put you know one year of money in there hoping there'd be some real reform so it wasn't an endless subsidy as well well there are people in this room who uh, applaud the limits that uh, the guardrails place and others who have in this room and elsewhere have said they're a bit of a straitjacket so again do you view the use, the regular use of carry forwards as an acceptable budgeting procedure or is it a gimmick? Well, we had robust discussions about this, but I considered uh, <laughs> the guardrails uh, one of the platforms for our prosperity and allowed us to make the investments we needed to. I considered the surplus money one time money. I don't think you fund recurring expenses with a one time surplus money, but we'll see where we are a year from now. Uh, Governor, there was a provision inserted in the budget which had absolutely nothing to do with the budget. It uh, restricts uh, the size of warehouses and distribution centers in towns that are between 6,000 and 8,000 in population, on um, parcels of land that are less than 250 acres, and more than five acres of wetlands, and are within two miles of an elementary school. You often say you are the first businessman to be elected governor. Um, here you are signing a budget that, that interferes with uh, home rule, local zoning, and uh, business development. Were you aware of this provision? Did you have any objections to this provision? Well, I wasn't aware of the provision, but what do you want me to do? Veto the budget over this? I'm, well, I, I look, I've never seen, I've I, never I think it's something we it. take a look at. It's uh, probably not the way I would have done it, but um, we got a budget done, bipartisan basis, and I'm going to sign it. Well, you're not suggesting that was make or break, right, on, on this? No, I don't think so. So you, couldn't you have said, take it out? Look, you may be shocked to hear this. I found out that it was in the budget um, probably the same time a lot of you guys did. There's uh, a lot of stuff that goes in at the last minute, and, um, you know. Would you have signed off on it if it was a separate? Uh, no. Vote? You would have vetoed that? Look, uh, we had about seven hours of discussion about whether the state should be uh, determining who builds houses where, and um, this seems to contradict a lot of that philosophy. Uh, the no, we are all feeling so good a minute yeah. ago. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Numbers for uh, heads of household and uh, and um, uh, joint filers, but that's a, a significant accomplishment. Uh, you know, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you think that'll mean for people? Look, it represents. Um, people have been talking about eliminating the income tax since I got into this game. We've eliminated the income tax for families earning up to about fifty thousand dollars. It's a ten percent plus tax cut for people earning up to about. 150,000, and then you still get a tax cut uh, for families up to about 300,000. I think it makes a difference in this uh, inflationary environment. It sends a signal, especially to working families in the middle class. This is a state that's um, on the mend, getting our fiscal house in order, and you're going to share the benefits of it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.
No questions for Kathy? No questions. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, I like Kathy and the wall at the top one.